if you run this model simultaneously, these two parameters here have a correlation. Now they have a, co a covariance. If you have a univariate model, if, if you have, we would just consider the first model, we know that the covariance matrix of the first model, if you just consider the first equation here, yeah, the corresponding parameter covariance matrix looks like this. So I have the variance of the uh, estimated alpha 1, you have the covariance of the estimated alpha 1 and beta 1, you have here the covariance of the estimated beta 1 and alpha 1, and here on, on the main diagonal, the second element of the main diagonal is of course the variance of the beta hat 1. Yeah? So that's the covariance matrix of the parameters if you estimate the first equation via OLS. So we have covariance matrix. So this, covari this covariance matrix becomes of course bigger because now we have two equations. Okay? So if you estimate this model simultaneously, your covariance matrix is a in this case, it's a 4 by 4 matrix, yeah? because we have two equations, we have two parameters in the first equation and two parameters in the second equation. But the covariance matrix or the part of the covariance matrix that we are actually interested in is only the covariance and the variance of these two point estimators. Okay? So the, the corresponding covariance matrix that we are interested in is the variance of the first point estimate alpha 1, the covariance of alpha 1 and alpha 2, we have here the covariance of alpha 2 and alpha 1, and the last year, the element on the main diagonal model is the variance of the point estimate alpha hat 2. Yeah? So that's the covariance matrix for these two parameters here that we are interested in. So the test statistic, lambda, let's denote lambda, and it's an estimate, it's the estimated test statistic lambda. How does it look like? So in our case, we have to square alpha hat 1 plus alpha hat 2. So we square these intercepts and we have to divide it by what is in the covariance matrix. So we have to divide it by the variance of alpha 1 plus the variance of alpha 2 plus two times the covariance of alpha 1 and alpha 2, okay? So because the covariance of alpha 1 and alpha 2 is the same like the covariance of alpha 2 and alpha 1, and this term pops up twice in the covariance matrix, so it enters also here twice in this term. So. That's basically the idea, the basic idea of the test statistic, and the test statistic is distributed, so lambda hat is distributed as chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom. Yeah? Chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom. Why two degrees of freedom? Well, because we have two parameters that we are interested in. So, and now you see already if you see this, this equation, so if we have three test assets, yeah, or let's say 25, this is usually the uh, amount of test assets um, that you encounter in the Farman French papers, so then the test statistic would be distributed as a chi square distribution with 25 degrees of freedom, and here we would have 25 intercept terms that would, would enter the uh, nominator and would have a huge amount of covariances that enter here. Uh, the lower part. So, and now you can think about 
what happens to the testes in lambda when the covariances are positive? Or what happens if the covariances are negative? Because if the, co if the covariances are negative, this guy here, yeah, it would basically, if, if all else is equal, and the, the uh, covariance here between these, these intercept terms is negative, it would, all else being equal, it would make the test statistic larger. So, so you would be more likely to reject the, the null hypothesis. If this is positive, and largely positive, so if there's a high correlation going on between these point estimates, it, it would mean all else being equal that this lower part of the equation becomes bigger, and all else being equal, this test statistic would become lower. So you would be less likely to reject the null hypothesis. So that's the impact of the covariance between these uh, intercept terms in this simultaneous equation model. Yeah, just, just that you know. So that's why we are interested in that. And that's why we have to use this multivariate or this, this multiple equation approach in order to compound this test statistic. When you read the Thwama and French papers, this test statistic is uh, often referred to as GRS test, gross uh, Ripperson and Shanken, um, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. So, whenever you hear this word GRS test, then you, yeah, then you know the test is about testing a certain amount of test assets and an asset pricing model and using basic testing if the intercept terms are simultaneously zero or different from zero. Yeah? No hypothesis, they are zero. If the hypothesis is accepted, then you know, okay, this asset pricing model, whatever you test here, works correctly. Whenever you reject the null hypothesis, implying that some of these or one of these intercepts is significant, then you would reject this model. Yeah? So, and you know how the distribution looks like, hopefully from econometrics courses. Let's just clear up the whiteboard a little bit. So the test statistic, of course, as I told you, is distributed as, as chi-square test. In this case, with two degrees of freedom, yeah, we have here the probability of the distribution and the chi-square chi distribution, if you remember, looks a little bit like this. Yeah, it's, a, it's a little bit uh, skewed to the left. And for, if you have, let's say, in usually you have a significance level of 5%, okay? So the uh, 5%, so 5% of the probability mass is here on the right-hand tile, tail 5% is here on the right-hand tile of the distribution, and 95% should be then here on the left-hand side of the distribution, 95%. So with the corresponding critical value of the chi-square distribution, if we have this chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom, so the correct value for the 90, 95% probability here will be 5.99. Yeah? So whenever your test statistic that you estimate this lambda hat, yeah, whenever this is above this value here, 5.99, if it's let's say 6.5, then this would imply that one or both of these uh, intercept terms are significant, implying that the, uh, the test statistic is, indicates significance of these uh, simultaneous test intercept terms, and you would reject that this model here is correct. Yeah? It doesn't work. So whenever the estimated lambda is below this value of 5.99, then you would say, okay, on a 5% significance level, I cannot reject the, hypo the hypothesis that this model here works correctly, hence I accept that this model here has the ability to price these test SSC on the, the left-hand side correctly.
So how would things look like if we just have one test asset? Yeah? This is the simplest case. Let's say we are just interested in this one test asset here. Yeah? Obviously, we don't use sewer anymore. We don't need it. So in this case, obviously, we just use ordinary least squares. Yeah? OLS. What you know from econometrics classes. Yeah? And in this case, we would just look at the alpha. Yeah? On the estimated alpha 1. And we don't need a chi square test or an F test. We can just use a simple T test. Yeah? You know this from statistics classes. I just write it one more time. You know the bell shaped curve of the normal distribution. So this guy here is asymptotically normally distributed at least as long as standard assumptions are satisfied. Maybe we will talk about this later at a, at a, at a, at a, a later stage, a little more detail. So I'm, I'm offering uh, next spring a uh, course for doctoral students, but also master students can take this course. And in this course, I will also uh, deal with the problem of induction, yeah? black swan theory. And we will also talk about why normal distribution or why the assumption of normally, of normally distributed uh, random variables is actually not satisfied in financial markets. Yeah? So we will go in, in, in detail um, through this topic and we will also talk about the consequences. But yeah, let's, let's follow this, this paper or the standard papers in finance yeah, where, where they assume that these guys are normally, are normally distributed uh, because the generating process is normally distributed. So in this case, we would compare the t-statistic of uh, the, this alpha that we estimate using OLS with the corresponding probability distribution and we know the values are 1.96 and minus 1.96. Yeah? So we know that if you have the normal distribution uh, that above 1.96, then we have 2.5% of the probability mass and below minus 1.96 here on this on the left tail, we also have 2.5% of the probability mass of the normal distribution. In the middle, of course, here we have 95% of the probability. So since this guy is this is uh, follows uh, is uh, t distributed or is they normally distributed, so we have to check the t statistic. So if the t statistic of that alpha here is, for instance, let's say the t statistic is 1.5, so what would be your inference? So your inference would be okay, since the t statistic is below the critical value of 1.96 and higher than minus 1.96. Given we have a 5% significance level, we cannot reject the hypothesis that this pricing model here prices this test effort on the left hand side correctly. So, hence we would, we would uh, assume that this model here works out. Okay? So, if the t statistic would be, let's say, 3.1, yeah? so 3.1 is somewhere here, okay? much far far above 1.96 so if we have a test asset and uh, we test test asset that has uh, where the alpha is higher or with the t statistic of the alpha is, uh, is let's say 3.1 then we would say okay this model here is not able to price this test asset here correctly hence this model here does not work out because here we have a pricing arrow yeah that is uh, we have a systematic pricing error here captured by this alpha that is statistically significant on a 5% level. Okay? So this would be your standard inference. So, in the Pharma and French paper, choosing factors,
they propose a right-hand side approach, yeah? as we already talked about. So the question arises, what's the problem with the left-hand side approach? What's the problem? And that's now an important uh, issue. So the problem with the left-hand side approach is that, let's say, you use a certain, certain uh, test assets, let's say you use 25 test assets sorted by size and book-to-market ratio, yeah? and you have on the right-hand side, you have, uh, let's say, you have the Farman French three-factor model, and you have, as an alternative model, you have the cap M. Okay? So, if you use it, it could be that if you use the Parallel French three factor model, it could, and uh, you run the, the uh, GRS test, you're testing the pricing else, it could be that the left hand side approach will give you, okay, using 25 asset test assets sorted by size and book to market ratio. The Farman French model uh, produces lower pricing errors than the Cap M, so the Farman French three factor model is the better model. So you, you would choose the Farman French three factor model. But it could be if you use a different set of test assets, let's say you use 25 test assets sorted by size and profitability instead. It could be that your result, the test result, will be exactly the other way around. It could be that this test will give you okay, the cap M produces uh, lower average pricing errors than the permanent French three-factor model, and hence you would, according to this test result, you would choose.